everyone. It's Friday's Chat with Mac. We're glad to have you. For those of you uh, that watch us uh, continuously and always giving feedback, which is surprising at the amount of feedback we get. We really appreciate it, like seriously. And for those of you that are new to what we do, welcome, welcome, welcome. Nadine, how's it going, sir? <clears throat> oh, it's going great. So, so we're recording this in the morning, and and you know we're still fresh here. So, <laughs> it's not like typically we do it like in the afternoons. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, no, yeah, I, I feel great. Uh, there's there's so many things going on. Actually, uh, earlier uh, uh, today, I had a great conversation. So, we we launched this new uh, product we're calling CyberX, and mm -hmm. and it's a security. Yep. Uh, as a service, right? So it includes, you know, antivirus, anti-malware, and, and behavior analytics, remediation. So there's a human factor in it. But one of the things that's interesting that I got a question on was um, it monitors your cloud accounts. So companies might have, you know, Dropbox, uh, Box.com, Office 365, Google Cloud, whatever. So this service connects to them and then monitors these cloud entities as well. And the question I got was this one uh, company, and it's a it's a it's a larger company. They have offices in in Sugarland and Dallas and, and multiple locations. So they they had an interesting question because they were showing login attempts for some of their users from different regions like uh, you know Massachusetts, New York, Korea and they were like we never knew that there were accounts trying to log in from there. So wow. this service kind of gave them an insight into what goes on that normally you don't see like you know you don't normally see people trying to log in from Korea into one of your users Office 365 accounts for example. And 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 that's what it kind of gives you an an overall picture of what's going on and it can show you on a map where people are trying to log into. One of the things that I'm very interested in as we roll this service out to all of our customers is to get some aggregate information, right? So we can kind of see patterns on how these attacks are happening. Like I want to be able to link geopolitical issues with attacks and attack vectors and that'll be that'll be interesting data to have um so i'm glad that the you know i, I didn't I, I mean so office 365 gathers some of this data anyway right it's it's reactive it's not in real time but i didn't think that companies were really interested in wanting to know where people were logging in from because people could be logging in from anywhere as long as they're not successful who cares right, right. but certain industries they they want to know where people are trying to log in from so this was this was just a interesting thing and we'll talk about it another time i don't want to take up all the time on that uh but uh what are we going to talk about today mac well, it's funny that you kind of talk about that aspect of it, especially with CyberX. You know, we were, last week, we were talking about everything that's been going on in Ukraine. And for those of you, you probably got an email from me referencing our last video that talks about Ukraine, which is very unfortunate, and our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine. Um, but at the same time, your small business and how it affects it. Uh, you know, Nadine talked about the ridiculous amount of attempts that have been coming out of China and Russia um, as far as uh, the hacking attempts, phishing attacks, uh, attempts and all that other good stuff. But the second part of it, and you got a defense, uh, you got a, I think it was called a defense ma uh, matrix that you saw, and a lot of you have been asking for that. If you want that, please email me and I'll get that over to you. But what I, what I would love for Nadine to talk about is the incident response plan. What is your plan should something like this, and not should, when, like the Dean says, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen, is there a plan in place? And the Dean, talk, talk to us more about that. Yeah, so so last week we talked about the security matrix, which uh, we, you know, we got we got a lot of feedback on it, and a lot of people wanted a copy of the matrix just so they can 
kind of make sure uh, you know they're following it and and basically people don't want to reinvent the wheel and and I understand that that's that's the whole idea here so uh, along with that you know one of the questions uh, came up is um, you know people asking us like hey do you have some kind of incident response plan or what do you do when there is an event and 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 there's there's two aspects of that so you know one is I would say there's a very small fraction of of people out there, not our customers, but people out there who who said that, oh, our uh, MSB has us protected and and we're good. And uh, you know, one one such person I was on the phone with, and I was like, so is your MSB guaranteeing you will not not get hacked or attacked by ransomware? <laughs> And if they are, you better run because yeah. nobody can guarantee that. You know, it's like yeah. a hurricane. Nobody can stop a hurricane. It's going to yeah. happen whether you want yeah. it to or not. Yeah. And people who are saying, oh, you know, I can stop hurricanes from happening. <laughs> take it as you will. But anyway, I wouldn't I wouldn't fall for that one. But but the incident response So that was interesting is, you know, people want incident response response lists so they can kind of follow a checklist. And this goes hand in hand with the security matrix, right? The security matrix is the overall security matrix, what you do, how you wanna handle different processes. Incident response is a little part of, of the security matrix. So let's just, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, and, and don't worry about the misspelling on remediate. I just uh, wrote that uh, uh, real quick. Uh, and I see now that it, I misspelled it. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> it's, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> uh, so, You'll see this is the post-incident checklist. Now, it is a post-incident checklist, but you have to have this in place before an incident happens. So even though it's called a post-incident checklist, you don't want to go and create this checklist after an incident happens. Uh, you have to have this in place. You have to, any par all the parties involved in this, all the roles involved in this, they should know what to do before an incident happens. So, and I'm going to just go real quick, uh, you know, over this. So the first thing is, you know, you want to stay calm because one of the things that happens is people get, let's say, a breach, they panic, and then they start doing things that they should not be doing. And we see it all the time. Mm -hmm. Things have been done that should not have been done. And then after a while, when things cool down, you ask them, you know, why did you do this to begin with? Oh, I thought I could get ahead of it because it was getting out of hand so fast. I thought I could get ahead of it and 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 fix it. It never works that way, folks. All the times that somebody's gotten an issue that that they come to us after an issue, and we found out that by trying to fix things quickly, they made matters worse. So the yeah. first thing, stay calm. Uh, you want to step back and make sure you don't make mistakes. So follow your process list, that security matrix, you know, follow that, the incident response list, follow that. Assemble your response team. So that's the first thing. The first thing you wanna do is have your response team ready to go and pull your plan. Uh, so you should have an incident response plan. So this is just the incident post-incident checklist. You should have an incident response plan as well. And that's that, written down document that you have. Yeah, I'm looking at everybody who doesn't have one. You need <laughs> to have it written down and whether it's written digitally or, or or in ink, doesn't matter, but it needs to be written down. Follow that, you gotta pull that because you're gonna follow that. Get your team ready. Uh, in your team, there's gonna be a breach coach. You know, you're gonna reach out to your breach coach. What are we gonna do? Notify the insurance carrier. Very important, and it's underlined. Do not engage in communications with a threat actor. Uh, an example I gave, and I'm going to quote this example again. I did a video earlier this week. Um, a party got ransomware attack. Uh, the ransom was fifty thousand dollars, and they engaged in communication with the threat actor, negotiated with them, and after their successful negotiations, 
the ransom was $350,000. So guys, unless you do this on a daily basis, day in and day out, don't try to negotiate with these guys. <laughs> Check your backups. Now, and I don't want to hurry through this, but backups are very critical and the bad guys know it. They try to sniff out backups. For example, the first ransomware attack that happened, this was many years ago. I remember the attack not only encrypted your regular files, but it also corrupted your shadow copies on your servers. That was the first thing that, that was one of the first attacks that happened. And, and they were looking for those avenues of, of restore that companies can use and, and destroying them ahead of time. So protect your backups. You should always have your backup in a separate system. So what that means is like, you know, if, if, if all, let's say, if your primary cloud is Microsoft's Azure cloud, then you want to have your backups in an alternate system. You know, so, so if something happens to one cloud, you still have your backups in another cloud. So mm -hmm. pull your third party contracts. Uh, you're going to have contracts with third parties, your suppliers, your vendors, your, your, your um, legal team. Uh, yeah. Pull those contracts. We're gonna, you're going to have to review them. And next few days are going to be real busy for you. So we're going to go through all of these in the next few days. So, so get that uh, ready. Isolate the impacted system. So you want to isolate the system. Uh, you don't want to do anything like remediation. Do not remediate. You don't want to try to fix things. You just want to isolate them as they are. Wait for the DFIR team. So the, the DFI is the Digital Forensic uh, in, uh, investigation, Investigative Response Team. You're going to have to wait for that team. Now, here's an important part here. You do not want your regular MSP to also be your DFIR team. You don't want the digital forensic investigation to be done by your regular MSP. There are legal implications for this, and, and we'll go into this in a little bit. Uh, so... Here, you want to have a breach coach slash attorney on retainer, right? So you should always have somebody on hand that you can reach out to in case of a breach. Uh, there are only a handful of attorneys that I know of across the country that specialize in this area. Um, so whether it's that or your uncle or cousin, whoever, doesn't matter. You need to have somebody ready. Uh, I have a question, maybe. Sure. Uh, uh, forgive me. So you said, uh, so you said not to let your MSP uh, be your DFIR team. Why, why is that? If you don't mind me asking, because I would think if your MSP is the one that facilitates your security, facilitates all of that, right. they would probably be your first person to go to. So first, let me put out a disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, so don't take legal advice from me. However, what the lawyers will tell you. Uh, the, the, the attorneys or the breach coaches will tell you is if a court compels the DFIR, DFIR team to do discovery of something, right, then if your, MSI, if your MSP is also your uh, investigative team, they will be compelled to reveal information you do not want to reveal. Mm. Now they'll be under court order to, to reveal information that you may not want out there. If it's a separate third-party DFIR team, then they only know stuff related to the incidents. They cannot reveal anything else because they don't know anything else. So that was a crucial part that, that a lot of times companies run into is they, they have their regular MSP do investigative reporting as well. And then in the process, now when that MSP gets a court order to, to show up in court or, or, or in discovery or whatever, now they are compelled to reveal information that you may not want getting out there. So, so that's the reason why. Okay, okay, gotcha. Finally, oh, do not awesome. wipe and restore, right? We need to preserve that evidence because if you wipe and restore and that evidence is gone, it's going to be a lot more he said, she said. And biggest issue that we see in this situation is going to be your cyber insurance provider is going to have a big problem with you at that point. You got another so, question? Yeah, so you said don't call it a breach. Why is that? 
Right. So so that's in communication. So first of all, we do not want to call it a be breach because the investigation is not complete. We do not know if it's a breach. We assume okay. it's a breach. We do not know. A lot of times what happens is people start talking about breach this or breach that or, hey, this happened. Uh, you know, like they say, lose lips, sink ships. Exactly <laughs> that's what happens. Keep it close. Only a select group of people should know what actually happened until the investigation is complete. Uh, un until, you know, it's like, it's like if you call the cops on something they're investigating, they will never tell you where they are, what they know, until the investigation is complete. If That's it's true. an ongoing investigation, don't say anything. Nobody That's needs true. to know anything. You don't know. You don't know yourself. You may assume certain things, but you do not know. Uh, and, and most importantly, again, there is the evidence piece of it. You do not want to wipe and restore because that causes all kinds of issues, especially if you do this before your DFIR team arrives on the scene or before they're done with their investigation, you've destroyed the evidence. Was there a reason you destroyed the evidence? Why would you do that? It opens a whole can of worms, so we don't want to go there. <clears throat> so hopefully this checklist will help people out there and if you need a copy of this, uh, reach out to Mac. Mac can provide a copy of this list. Uh, you know, this is the same checklist that that we would follow, that any company out there would follow when there's a breach. Uh, you need to have this in place. It's it's very important. And and some of the other things that you want to have in place is uh, get in touch with us. You know. Your, who's going to be your DFIR team? You know what organization is going to do your your investigative uh, reporting? Uh, who's going to be your your coach, uh, your breach coach, or your attorney? Uh, have them on some type of retainer so you can reach out to them. Typically, your MSP will have resources they can put you in touch with. Resources that do this on a daily basis. That attorney that you have on a retainer is the one who should be doing the negotiation part. That attorney will bring in an expert to do the negotiation with the bad guys. You don't want to do that on your own. Or you go from 50,000 to 350,000 ransom and think you came out ahead. Don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, and, and that actually happened. Uh, so, so yeah, there are some, you know, typically people who don't encounter this on a daily basis, to them, it's like, oh, it happens to other people. It's not going to happen to me. You know, it's like it's like an accident. You know, you always assume it's going to happen to somebody else. It's not going to happen to me. Or, you know, an example of a plane crash. Oh, it's not going to be my plane. What are the chances? It's, it happens to other people. But the thing is, you need to be prepared for things like this before they happen. And, and that's what the assume breach concept is all about. Get Get your ducks in a row before it happens. So when it happens, you already know what to do. And it just falls one, two, three. It makes it easier for everybody involved. And in the end, it will work in your favor. You know, by that, you know, whatever the court rulings are, whatever the payouts from the insurance companies are, at the end of the day, it will all work out better for you. So, so this list is very important. So let me ask you something, Nadeem, in regards. I, I have a two-fold question. Do all MSPs have an incident, uh, uh, in theory, do they all have an incident response plan? And then two, from the time a breach happens to the time that the DFIR and all of that, how long is the company usually down for before they back up running uh, business as normal? Yeah, good, good question. As far as MSPs, um... Not all MSPs have incident response plans. Not M all MSPs have uh, a process list, a procedure list. Uh, you know, it's, you know, like I say, um, IT, it's not a regulated industry. A person can wake up one day, go to an IT show, buy a few tools, call themselves an MSP, and boom. They're an MSP. Uh, we call them the 10-minute MSPs, right? But uh, so not everybody has 
an incident response plan. Some organizations require their partners and customers to get the response plans from their services providers, right? And and we've dealt with a few companies like that where we had to provide our incident response plan to to the customer or to to this organization that you know kind of regulates that industry. And usually it happens in industries that are regulated, but not everybody has it. Second thing, it depends on the DFIR team how soon they can they can start the investigative process. Typically, these these teams are are fairly good because keep in mind you're going to have somebody on standby, right? You should have somebody on standby ahead of time, or your attorney has somebody on standby that they can get involved really quick. However, we have seen where it can take. I've I've seen it like take a whole week before they actually engage, not because of a delay on the DFIR team side, but because of a delay on the company that got breached side, right? They just they, they just didn't know what to do. So they were like, you know, trying out different things. And, and finally, they realized they need to have a DFIR team. Uh, and by the way, that stands for Digital Forensic Investigative Reporting. So they involved that and then the team, you know, scheduled it and, and they started doing the investigation and all that. The thing is, even if it takes a week or two weeks, I have never seen it work out well when somebody jumped the gun and remediated the issue before an investigation. Mm. It never worked out well for them. Most time, well, almost well, every time that I've been involved in when a DFIR team and a breach coach was involved, the outcome was much better than in a situation where companies thought they could just handle it internally themselves. Mm -hmm. They were thinking mm -hmm. they were doing good. They were thinking they can keep everything hush hush if they keep it internal, but they just didn't have the resources or the experience. And it ended up blowing up bigger than it had to be. So so the thing is, you need to get the right people involved. And and a lot of times, you know, these companies come to us and, and, and I tell them, and this is, you know, post-breach, and I tell them, you know, we are not a DFIR firm. We don't do this, you know. We don't do uh, breach coaching. We don't do investigative reporting, you know. The forensic analysis that we do is is limited to what an MSP should be doing as far as forensic analysis, you know, like okay. a piece of code came in from somewhere or monitoring different systems, seeing what's going on, things like that. Okay. Okay. We are not a legal investigation discovery team here. We have we have a lot of contacts that do that, you know, third parties who do that. You know, like these are lawyer type people and and people, technical people who all they do is work with these bad guys and invest investigative reporting and stuff like that, where they know how to negotiate. I mean, these guys just by looking at a breach, they can pretty much tell what party is involved in that breach. They're, that's because that's all they do, right? So, so it's very important to have this uh, list, and 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 I encourage you, you know, reach out to Mac if you need a copy of this list. Good thing to have, um, yeah. and it's always better to be prepared. The costs are much less if you are prepared uh, as opposed to if you're caught unprepared. Um, and um, I think uh, with that, Mac, we'll call it a day. It's uh, you know, I've I've taken more than twenty minutes now. <laughs> You know, I did have, I, I, I'm sorry, this, this stuff is very, I just have one question that we can cut it. With our, with CyberX, with our uh, monthly recurring, re, uh, you know, plans, is this something that's included where where, where we would be? So, yeah, so, so this is not going to be included in any MSP plan. This does not fall into the MSP umbrella. This is going to be a third party that the customer has to work directly with. So well, we would, an we MSP would have like us may to... facilitate, like we may uh -huh. put you in touch with attorneys okay. and, and, gotcha. and the DFR firms, but okay. we're not going to be the go-between. We're not going to be in the middle. Right, now, right. The, the DFIR team and these attorneys will want to talk to us as an MSP, right? But we're not going to be involved directly with these entities. 
And we want that separation of roles because gotcha. down the line, when, when this becomes a legal issue, you want to be able to separate out the roles so that only minimal uh, and to the point information is revealed. So, so the MSP does not have to do reveal any more information because now all of a sudden they're part of the discovery. Well, no, that's, you know, so, so there are some legal things that, that we need to consider, uh, but no, and this does not fall into the MSP umbrella. Uh, no MSP that I know of do this. Uh, and if some MSPs are doing this, like they may be doing it on the side or as an additional thing, you know, they may be saying, oh, we're going to, we're going to do DFIR as well. That's a bad place to be in because if company A is is your MSP and the same company A also did your digital investigation, that company A, when they get called in discovery, and this is a legal discovery, they will have to reveal a lot more of what they know because they know what they know. If it was a different entity who knew the details of certain things, they that third party won't have to reveal it. But if you're sitting there in the discovery, you have to reveal what you know. And you can't say, I don't know. You have to reveal it. So there's there's some issues there. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, so, th you know, and this is out of my realm. I'm not a legal guy. So, uh, but I can put you in touch with some, some legal folks out there who do this on a day in and day out basis. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, it's a wild west out there. It is. <laughs> it definitely is. <laughs> All right, folks, with that, I think we'll call it a day. And uh, uh, Mac, if you know, as people reach out to you, go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll send you a copy of this list so you can send okay. them out. And okay. um, we kind of go from there. And everybody have a, have a good weekend and uh, be safe out there. Guys, have a good one.